My guest today is Bulgarian-born Arto Artinian, who teaches philosophy at an American university and is known in, to the left-wing audience from the YouTube channel The Barricade. Hello. 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 Thank you for uh, having me on your show, Mikhail. So, uh, so I have. Oh, I will make it. Uh, uh, so I have first question. I prepared some question before. Uh, uh, I have a philosophical question for you. Let us imagine that there is a country of peripheral capitalism that is indebted to the imperialist imperialist metropolis in which a large part of the industry is controlled by the bourgeoisie of the imperialist countries. In this country, there is a victory of the socialist revolution as a result of which enterprises belonging to foreign capitalists are nationalized and the debts incurred by the previous government says to be repaid. This country begin, begins to build socialism, carries out rapid industrialization and sends a man into space. Millions of citizens experience a civiz civilizational advancement and have access to free universities and hospitals. In a word, the socialist government proves that the state can function well without the bourgeoisie. My question is as follows. It is possible to objectively describe the successes of this state in imperialist countries. Is it possible to speak and write objectively about the leaders of socialist state? Or is a, every socialist leader by definition a dictator and a totalitarian murderer? And every socialist state is empty shells and famine? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> it's a great question for our time because as uh, we know, it's becoming more and more difficult to talk about that hypothetical country that you described, <laughs> which, <laughs> which uh, sent people into space and nationalized and created public libraries and universal health care before we even talked about universal health care as a thing in, in the West or in the United States specifically. Um, to answer your question, um, I don't think it's possible for bourgeois politicians uh, or imperialist country political elites to think about or to talk about um, the political system of the country that you described, this kind of socialist post-capitalist society, as anything but the enemy, because it represents the total negation of, of what capitalism represents. And what is capitalism, actually? I mean, if we ask ourselves, we get the answer, which is capital, contemporary capitalism is liberal parliamentary democracy which technically in one sense is correct because you have an election that is, uh, you have a government in most parts of the, many parts of the world in the United States, in European Union, in Poland and Bulgaria, we have parliamentary republics where citizens vote and choose their government. But what's, what's missing from this very simple description of the political system of capitalism is who has political power in parliamentary democracies. Yes, we all have the right to politically protest like the protests in France that are happening right now. But political power is in the hands of the, of the capitalist class, which is a minority, a very small percentage of the population of any capitalist society, which means it must be by definition an anti-democratic government. If political power is in the hands of a very, very small percentage of the population, that is not a democratic government. And actually the United States political elites are much more honest about this in their classical documents from the 18th century where they call themselves a republic, not a democracy. And republic, of course, we know since Roman history, since the Roman Republic, republics are uh, not democracies. They are governments of limited democracy, democracy only for the capitalist class, the, the class that has political power and is in literally is in control of the government or the state in most directly. So I think when those people, you know, the contemporary capitalist class or, and their political representatives talks about the Soviet Union or the Eastern European socialist systems or post-capitalist systems, some people don't like the word socialism. Well, I can say post-capitalist if that makes them happier. Um, that presented a model of human development, even more than important than economic development, but human development that achieved 
unthinkable achievements on the level of overall human social development taken as a whole. And it did it without a capitalist class existing in that society. And as a result, they, they are the existential enemy of uh, any kind of socialist, post-capitalist political system. Today, that would be China, you know, or Cuba or uh, Vietnam, et cetera. But I don't think those, uh, the capitalist class of any imperialist uh, liberal democracy can portray publicly uh, any aspect of, of uh, the Eastern European uh, post-capitalist socialist system as anything but failure, totalitarianism, you know, something that is the negation, the opposite, the most horrible thing that you can imagine uh, compared to the capitalist imperial states. You know, for for make this question easier, we can give example of the uh, Korean Peninsula, where okay. if you are from north and to go, you go to south, and you want to say something positive about the um, uh, Korea du Nord, you are go to prison. It's mm -hmm. it's written in the law that it's it's banned um, to 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 say something good about and it is not a question I am agree or not with the system which exists in the North Korea. I only try to make serious conversation about the uh, about the possibilities of the intellectuals in the inter imperialist countries. Uh, because uh, in your response you talk about um, about bourgeoisie. Uh, my question was about the so-called intellectuals, left intellectuals, even <clears throat> anti-capitalist intellectuals. You know that uh, how it is possible that anti-capital, so-called anti-capitalist intellectuals, can. Uh, critique uh, the bourgeoisie in their state can support the class struggle strike but when it's the question of the real real existing socialist state uh, now they uh, now they change uh, the uh, they camp and they starting to say yes it was the ter totalitarian terror holodomor uh, dictatorial system uh, stuff like this so i try to uh, understand it is uh, uh, it is one example or another example or it is a rule that if you are working in the western university you are obliged to to criticize the soviet union because if not you will be unemployed or even like in south korea you go to prison i, I mean it's i think this is very uh, critical central question Mikhail, and i think for my experience working in uh, Western University, I mean, I live uh, more than a big part of the year in Bulgaria, and then I travel to, to my university job, so I see kind of both sides. And I would say in the West, in my experience, the left consists of two parts. One part is what I would call um, honest leftists, you know, honest socialists or communists or, you know, anarchists, etc., who understand that going through a social revolution is something that's incredibly difficult and challenging and surviving long enough to establish state power and the possibility to create a post-capitalist society is even bigger challenge. And it's a challenge because the moment the revolution happens and overthrows the capitalist state, immediately the counter-revolution is mobilized using external forces, as we know from history of the last 100 years at least. So at that point, the easy decisions about authoritarian states, about the need for um, civil war to be waged, like it happened in across the Russian empire in 1917, the way it happened across Eastern Europe, the way it happened after World War II in parts of Europe and in, across the post-colonial world, the way it happened in China, the Chinese revolution is over 25 years before it ended. So I think in the West, we have a small group of people who uh, under, try to understand what the Soviet or the Eastern European socialist system was or the Chinese system is today objectively as much as possible while being outside of it. But I think the much bigger part of the so-called left, as you say, in Western universities is a deeply compromised um, fake pseudo left, however you want to call it, that deeply is anti-revolutionary and anti-communist. 
And I think that's the, it plays the role of a, of a false opposition. In other words, the ruling uh, class says, well, you see, there are socialists in France or there are socialists in America. Of course, they don't support China. They're anti-Chinese in terms of its political orientation. They're critical of the Soviet Union and Eastern European uh, uh, socialist past, but they fight against repression, racism, etc. So I think most of the left in the, in the Western uh, world, first of all, is in universities, the intellectuals, and they're not, they're compromised. They're intellectually compromised and they're politically compromised. And I think this may sound a little strange, but I think my opinion as an Eastern European who grew up in the socialist period, I mean, I was 16 when the socialist system uh, ended in Bulgaria, uh, and shortly thereafter, I went to the United States to, you know, to go to college and I had relatives there, my aunt, my father, sister, etc. So I saw both sides. I think Western Marxism specifically suffers from a very, very big disadvantage compared to Eastern European, uh, if we want to stay in Europe, Eastern European uh, Marxists, is that they never had a, their movements, their political organizations never were able to participate in a successful anti-capitalist revolution. It's a history, Western Marxism is a history of complete failure relative to capitalist state. Yet, because they are in the imperialist core of the world, they have intellectual hegemony on Marxism, if that makes sense. In other words, we read Adorno a lot more than we read Georgi Lukács, right? We read, um, we read John Maynard Keynes, the great you know, British economist who was a fa yeah, Fabian yeah. socialist, kind of like a, not really a revolutionary socialist, but more like a state socialist of the British empire. But we don't read the great Polish you know, uh, economist, Oskar Langa and Mikhail Kalecki. We don't read Kalecki on the left in the West. And Kalecki has a lot to teach us, a lot more than Keynes because Kalecki, as you know, also did a lot of work on the centrally planned economies. So a lot of the, what we call Marxism in the world is, it comes from Western Marxism. And I think by definition, a lot of it, while it contains brilliant uh, works, individual works, I think a lot of that thought is politically weak, unuseful, and um, it has failed the historical test in its own societies. So, but I think because they come from the imperialist West and they have global power, uh, Marxism of the 21st century more often than not, is still the deeply flawed interpretations about the Soviet system, about China, about um, Eastern European intellectuals who are Marxists or socialists like Mikhail Kalecki. Uh, we don't study them. We don't know them. And people don't know them. The younger generations don't know them. And thus, we have a big problem. The problem is, like you say, our own history in Eastern Europe is seen as a caricature, as a joke you know, totalitarianism, everything was bad, everything was gray, the sky was always dark, it was always rainy, there was never sun. You know, when I was a student in um, the university in the United States, right when the Soviet system fell apart, when my professor found out that I was from Bulgaria, this was in class in, in um, political science, political philosophy, and she said, wow, we have a student from Eastern Europe, let's ask about how did you survive? <laughs> <laughs> did you have toilet paper? You know, did you, how did you not eat enough? You know, I said, I I'm sorry, I don't, my English is not very good. What are you talking about? You know, they, they had no idea. To this day, most Western Marxists, most American Marxists that I talk to have absolutely no idea what life was like in the Soviet Union or Bulgaria or Poland. They have no idea. They, have, they know nothing about the intellectual life. They know about Georgi Lukács. They might know about Kalecki, very few people, maybe specialist economists. They know about Lenin, but they don't know about the main intellectual figures of the Soviet Union. Of po I mean, P Poland, they may know Stanislav Lem, maybe, maybe, but they don't even know Lem because they know the American science fiction writers, which were much less philosophically interesting. They don't know the Strugatsky brothers. They don't know Tarkovsky. They may know Tarkovsky, but they don't know the Strugatsky brothers. So I think to summarize, very little is known about Eastern European uh, socialist period intellectual life in the West. I think that's deliberate. 
And uh, that's a big part of the problem. And to say about North Korea, I don't, when people ask me about North Korea, I say, I don't know anything about North Korea objectively because my only sources are Western sources. And I don't trust any of them because when I went to America for the first time, they asked me if I had toilet paper, if I was eating enough food, because that's what they wrote in the New York Times. So I don't believe anything the New York Times says about North Korea. So, <laughs> I, I can give you an example from my past that in the 1990s, uh, it, was, uh, it was more than 20 years ago. And when I was young, I was uh, 14, 15 years old. I, my older brother, he became a member of Trotsky's organization, very little Trotsky's organization, which the central of this organization is in London. It's mm -hmm. called Socialist Workers Party, but it is not socialist, in, not workers <laughs> and not party. Yeah. Uh, but there, there are a few guys from, uh, from, uh, from England who came to Poland uh, and started to, to build this Trotsky movement. Uh, they never, uh, uh, never reached uh, the objective. It was always a very small organization. And our, our grandfather, um, Andrzej Nowicki, he was a professor of philosophy in a socialist Poland. He was a specialist from the religious question. Uh, in the 1950s, he was responsible for the fight with the Catholic Church and he wrote many anti-clerical uh, books. Uh, after he was pushed um, pushed out from Warsaw, he he when Gomuka came to power and uh, the relations with Catholic Church changed, so he became a professor in Wrocław. <laughs> uh, but it's not important. The important is that in my house there was a, a lot of book. A lot of books uh, written by the Marxists from Poland, Marxists from Soviet Union. It was <laughs> in this time I was not interested uh, of these books, but when I started to, to, to when I st started to collaborate with this uh, small Trotsky's organization. Uh, uh, they gave me some uh, sm small books, and uh, now you have to read it. Uh, ABC Marxism, what is Marxism, stuff, stuff like this. And I read it and ask, and I ask a question. Listen to me, I have some qu uh, books about Marxism. And uh, I, I take this book up with me. I show you, well, look, this is very good book. Uh, it's, uh, it's professional because they book it was 20 pages. <laughs> oh, no, no, it is bullshit. It is Stalinist. Uh, don't read it. Don't read it. It was, uh, they, they never, they never know, know this, this author. They never read this book, but uh, and, uh, they, they, they say to me, don't read this book. It is it is the so-called Marxist uh, who uh, the, the advice uh, of them. Mm. Okay, yeah. I, I I will read the second question. Um, now I would like to ask about the countries of the so-called West in the times of Marx and Lenin. These were these were states responsible for colonial exploitation and genocide by the, the best example of which is the Belgian colony in the Congo. The history of the USA is the history of slavery on plantations, the extermination of Indians and the racial segregation. Racism was the dominant ideology of the Western countries and the ideology of the, and practice of the Third Reich is only a continuation of the criminal racism of the Western countries. How did the modern left see the West synonymous with paradise on earth? According to the modern left, the West is democracy, human rights, and many other cliches that the whole world should imitate. I have been living in France for many years, and right now there are huge protests that are brutally pacified by the French police. Despite President Macron's Overt authoritarianism, the left still presents the West as a role model. Can you explain this phenomenon? I think the phenomenon can be explained by saying that the left, uh, so-called left, is not politically 
um, interested in fighting neither the, the capitalist state nor capitalism itself. So I think at this point, using labels like the left uh, becomes pointless in political language because they mean exactly the opposite of uh, what they're supposed to mean. Otherwise, it becomes meaningless, right? So I think it's not surprising that the left in the West, France, Belgium, across the European Union, uh, most of the United States, is not interested in trans systematic uh, systemic change, movement away from capitalism, beyond capitalism, towards some type of an egalitarian uh, political and economic system. It simply means that people who call themselves left and act that way and write these things and have these ideas that are not critical of, of capitalism and its interaction with racism, they're simply... Uh, they're simply just a, a form of liberals. They're just liberals with left, with with not with socialist language, if you will. <laughs> they're not. They're not liberals. You know, the great Italian filmmaker poet uh, Pasolini uh, made a great point in one of his um, articles. He said, "In order to be a, a communist, he was talking about himself. Uh, you have to live like one." As, much, as best as you can. You have to, as honestly as you can, Pasolini said, live the way the ideals of your politics say you should live. And he, I mean, he took it very seriously. He even took it uh, in terms of his uh, public persona, his language, his practices, his art, you know. So I think when we look at uh, what is called the typical leftist, whether it's a left political party in France or in Bulgaria in parliament or these are not leftist parties. They are essentially liberal parties. Uh, maybe you can call them left liberal parties, but they are liberals. They are part of the ideology of the capitalist class. Liberalism is the, is the political philosophy of the capitalist class. So I think those new leftists or the left uh, that is silent on what's happening in Paris or, or, is, or is interpreting the, the repression of the, of the French state of its own population over this deeply social issue right? Uh, they're not, they're nothing but liberals. And I think we should best call them liberals and not leftists, because otherwise that word kind of becomes meaningless, if that makes sense. So I think what you're saying is, and what I, I agree with, is that uh, socialist, communist thought uh, in the West is, has been com almost completely uh, destroyed or taken over by uh, liberals who call themselves leftists. And I think that's the first big problem. That's the first problem that we need to uh, cleanse ourselves from and identify ourselves as different from those leftists. I think that's the first maybe task of a new kind of a new um, anti-capitalist uh, intellectual movement. <clears throat> okay, so now I will have a very difficult question. Um, it's about Marx that uh, that uh, today the left uh, which we are talking about uh, most of them support the imperialist uh, uh, western states uh, in the in the war in ukraine uh, mm -hmm. they support in this way that they are all the time uh, repeat the anti-Putinist propaganda and uh, of course this is different that uh, but s some of this organization for example for Trotsky's organization new anti-capitalist party called uh, openly that we need to send weapons to, to Ukraine uh, this Ukraine which exists with all this Nazi propaganda but the question of Marx is that uh, it's not against Marx. When we when we look the history of the um, January insurrection in 1863, it was insurrection organized by the Poles. It was it was the from the class perspective, it was something uh, very reactionary. It was because it was the. It was the uh, revolution organized by the nobles uh, against Tsar. And Tsar, when he promised to re land reform, uh, the peasants supported Tsar, not the nobles. And all the Western capitalist countries in this time, they, were, they supported Poland. They were against Russia. 
and the 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 first international was created in the meeting of the solidarity of the polish insurgency so the the socialists from the western countries uh, they supported this uh, the external politics of the they own bourgeoisie the the the, the british empires uh, and uh, and also I think that I don't know. It is a question that Marx was a little Russophobic, uh, that he he supported all the things against against Russia. What do you think about this? Um, do you also want me to sort of comment on what the the current kind of war in the Ukraine between NATO and Russia in in this context? No, 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 no. About or, or Marx. Just about Marx. Uh, Marx. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, also, uh, you, you know, maybe it's better start from the war in Ukraine yeah. because my position <laughs> is that uh, that I am uh, from the history. I know that every uh, every revolutionary movement in the world where it was uh, they, uh, they tried to destroy from the the, the imperialist countries uh, try to destroy this revolution this is the example of the russian revolution and many other revolution in the other part of the of the continent uh, of the world uh, so for me the 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 the, the biggest threat is the in nato and I am against NATO. It's not that I support the oligarchic uh, R Russia, is that, but uh, in this war, I think that uh, that uh, that uh, I, I take the Lenin's position that the, the my enemy is the bourgeoisie of of my state. Uh, I am living in Poland. I am living in France. I am living in NATO. So my enemy is NATO. Uh, so it is my position, and the position of Marx uh, in this in this question the, uh, against Russia, he supported, uh, the, I think, uh, the British government. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> one way to approach the war in the Ukraine is by asking, by looking at what happened in the immediate thirty years leading to it. First of all. We have the, the breakup of the Soviet Union, which is done not, not exactly legally within the constitutional framework either. So we have the, the breakup of the Soviet Union, and usually such breakups are followed, unfortunately, by civil wars. And we have had civil wars in the Soviet Union, post-Soviet space, Azerbaijan, Armenia. Yes, under the rubric of the newly independent states. But these are essentially civil wars because they are fought... Um, on the terrain of what used to be one, uh, one country with deeply integrated uh, people uh, where different nationalities and ethnicities were definitely integrated uh, in ways that were, was very difficult to speak in terms of national identity, the way you would speak about it perhaps now, 30 years later. So in one sense, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict is the last civil war that came, unfortunately, after the breakup of the Soviet Union. But if we look at the history leading up to it, it's most definitely an imperialist caused war. Why? Because Ukraine and, and Russia coexisted as independent post-Soviet states perfectly fine until 2014. And there were never any hints that there was going to be any kind of uh, horrific fighting between these two peoples until 2014. But what happened? What happened is the complete... Uh, refusal of NATO, which is a, the largest military alliance in the world. It's the largest military alliance in the world. It's complete refusal to, to declare Ukraine a military neutral uh, country, which is not an unreasonable thing to ask for, uh, I think precipitated the war. And, uh, but what really bothers me in Ukraine is that the way Ukrainian national identity was, was shaped in the last 30 years by the imperialist West, which is of all of the different strains of Ukrainian national history and identity, including the Soviet period, which was the, the, the Ukrainian state uh, was founded really during uh, the Soviet Union. I mean, the, the, the Ukrainian Republic of, the, of 1917 through 1918 was uh, too short-lived to count, 
right? I mean, it was in the midst of the civil war. But Ukraine already existed as a state, as a Soviet republic. Um, but what happened after 1991? Uh, the European Union, which is essentially politically colonized by the United States and militarily occupied, um, activated the neo-Nazi element of Ukrainian national identity. So the Western Ukrainian nationalism, which collaborated with, uh, uh, with Hitler's United Europe invasion of the Soviet Union, and engaged directly in genocidal killings of their political and uh, uh, ethnic enemies in Ukraine and Poland and Belarus, under the control of the German occupying army, those people and their political ideology increasingly became the national identity of Ukraine, which it is today, because Stepan Bandera is a national hero of Ukraine, officially. Right? Now, once you declare Stepan Bandera and his political movement to be the national hero and the foundational ideology of Ukraine, you cause a civil war in Ukraine. Why? Because in World War II, the ratio of Ukrainians fighting with the Soviet army compared to those Ukrainians who are fighting with the Nazis against the Soviet army was 10 to 1 according to official Ukrainian historiography today. Three million Soviet Ukrainians were in the Red Army and about 300,000 Ukrainians were in the German army and German allied Ukrainian uh, or armies and police forces, una upa. So the Ukrainian people 10 to 1 fought against the politics of Bandera and his masters, the European Nazis and fascists. And if you force that ideology as the real, true, freedom-loving ideology of what it means to be Ukrainian today, you're going to cause a civil war. And that's exactly what happened. Because many people in Ukraine, I would say most, if they really had to, for, especially the generation older than people who were born after 1991, will find that to be incomprehensibly arrogant because almost everybody in Ukraine has somebody who died in World War II. Ukraine was the highest percentage of casualties together with Belarus and Poland in, in World War II, in Europe, per, 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 per population. So it's a big slap in the face to say that what it means to be Ukrainian today is to be Ukrainian, the way Bandera and, and the other UPA and UNA uh, neo-Nazis decla uh, Nazis declared Ukrainian identity to be, in other words, a racially defined nationalism with its own distinct uh, religion that is defined to be anti-Russian and anti-Polish, racially speaking. That is unthinkable in a land that gave millions of people dead in World War II. So you were gonna cause a, a civil war and that's exactly what happened and that's exactly they did that, why they did that. Why the provocation was engineered to split the country and to cause uh, 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 essentially a civil war, which then of course became, as you said earlier, enlarged because the imperialist bloc through NATO directly now uh, 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 runs the war from Kiev and of course the Russian state responds as well. So I think the Ukrainian war is, a, is, a, is one, a proxy war between the United States and Russia. The, the aim, of course, is not Ukraine, unfortunately. The, the, the aim is to control Russia, just like it was. Um, I think that war. it is not control. It is destroy Russia. Dismemberment. The, yeah, colonization. Yeah, the, it's a colonization the, project. The, 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 one of the Polish politicians, uh, she was uh, in the past the foreign minister of Poland. Now she, she is in Euro Parliament. Uh, she wrote article that uh, we need to uh, make from the Russian Federation 20 or 30 independent countries. And they uh, she tried to to be now the big friend of this all, all this Asian uh, Asian nation of Russian Federation. And it is very funny because in the anti-communist propaganda in Poland, when they try to um, describe the Red Army soldiers in the uh, 44, 45, they said, uh, the, they came to Poland. Uh, they starting to raping, uh, rape Polish women mm -hmm. uh, because it was barbarian. 
Asiatic horde. Yeah. So, so in all this anti-communist propaganda, uh, the, the the word Asiatic mm -hmm. was something uh, something very bad. And now, uh, now uh, to destroy the Russian Federation. And now we yes we support the Buryat, Yakut, uh, Chechen, or uh, all, all these nations. So it's hypocrisy, mm -hmm. hypocrisy masterclass. It's very racist and it's maybe it's not very shocking anymore. Maybe it's good to see the racism that's at the core of uh, imperialism because whether that imperialism is expressed through uh, the British government or through the kind of the secondary forces like Poland and etc., it's in the open now. And by the way, the Polish uh, conservative elites who of course are going to take parts of Western Ukraine as soon as they can, uh, must kiss the ground that the Soviet soldiers walked on because without them, Poland will not exist. Because accompanying the defeat of the Soviet Union by the Nazi-led European imperialist forces of World War II, Poland certainly would not be permitted to exist as a state either under the racial um, ideology of the, of the Fuhrer. We know this because we know Plan Ost, you know, the, the, the strategic yeah, document. Not state, not nation. The nation have to be exterminated but, or uh, Germanized. Yeah, Poland would be completely exterminated along with Ukraine, along with Belarus, and parts of Russia would be physically exterminated to a large extent, according to the planning documents of the German uh, government of 1941. So the Polish bourgeois elites should kiss the ground of every Soviet monument in Poland and thank the Soviet Union and Stalin for defeating the biggest war machine in the, of the world at that time. And by the way, overturning the racist argument that the dirty Asiatic peoples overwhelmingly and completely destroyed uh, the white European, you know, uh, uber class of, of, of superior humans represented by the German Reich and its servants. So it's very funny, but if you think about it, um, a lot of these uh, regimes that owe their political existence to the Soviet Union's victory over the imperialists of the day, forget that very fact, which shows their incredible ignorance, which means they're going to make mistakes again. And hopefully those mistakes will not cause another tragedy for their societies the ways it is. Because we do know that before World War II started, the Polish government courted Hitler's government. We, we have read those, those uh, conversations between the Polish foreign minister and, and Hitler where there were offers made by the, by the <laughs> uh, Polish government to join uh, Hitler's coalition against Stalin. Right. So in other words, they're, they're eerie. Yeah, they parallels. already collaborated to destroy Czechoslovakia. Yes. So they're eerie parallels to what's happening today. Of course, today, what I don't understand is that obviously Ukraine is getting destroyed, which is just unbelievable crime. Ukraine is getting destroyed by being forced into a war by NATO, by the imperialist West, in this way. It's almost like they can't even negotiate for peace because the, the U.S. Secretary of State said two weeks ago, we don't think uh, ceasefire is very good for our interests right now. Well, what about the interests of the Ukrainians? You know? But anyways, I, the big question for me in the Ukrainian-Russian civil war, which at the same time as the Russia-NATO war, is how are the Western imperialist strategists thinking that they can defeat Russia militarily? Because it's the largest nuclear power in the world, and it's the most sophisticated army in the world. Now, I know this is because of racism. The Russians are made fun of, that they don't know how to fight. Who knows how to fight in large-scale ground warfare other than the Russians or the Ukrainians? The post These are the, the Soviet, this is the post-Soviet army fighting each other. The Ukrainians and the Russians fighting each other are officers trained in the Soviet army who went to the same schools fighting each other. These are the Europe's and the world's premier uh, ground fighting forces. The British army is not a strong ground army. The British have never been a strong military force on the ground, right? They're a joke, so they're not a factor. So when I hear in the news that the British are training Ukrainian soldiers, I start laughing. The Ukrainian army has far better training capabilities and understanding of ground warfare because of their Soviet experience and inheritance than the stupid British army that has never fought a, a high intensity ground war except to colonize peoples of very smaller countries like Iraq, Syria. Yes, India in the 19th century, but those were different times. And they lost in India too, by the way. 
as we know. So what's, I don't understand how NATO or the imperialists think they can win this war militarily or break apart Russia, assuming that Russia has the largest and most advanced nuclear arsenal in the world. I think they're playing, I think they're not rational. And if that's true, then we're living in very dangerous times because we might see nuclear war and our mutual annihilation, which would be completely irrational and stupid, you know, I mean, if it were so tragic. So I don't know what's going on through these people's minds. Never before in history have two nuclear powers fought each other directly in war. And that's happening right now. You know, the, wet, the NATO versus the Russian Federation. These are two nuclear powers that are fighting each other. That's extremely stupid and it's extremely dangerous because you can't win. You cannot take over Russia militarily because they'll fire nuclear weapons if their national security is threatened, just the way uh, Western nuclear powers will do if their national security is threatened. But nobody's threatening their national security because nobody's planning the invasion of England. But England is clearly planning the invasion and occupation of Russia. So how are they gonna win? How is the British government gonna win a war against the Russian nuclear arsenal? I have no idea, but the answer is they can't. So. What's happening? I think that the American allies are rational. The European allies are not rational. But all this war in Ukraine is um, is very good interest for 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 American. They destroyed the the dependence of Europe from the Russian resources. Uh, now they the Europe is dependent uh, from the uh, resources from from USA uh, and the the factories from Europe go to USA the the eastern uh, countries of of Europe have to buy the the American weapons so everything is good for for for, for United States uh, it's not good for Germany. It's uh, it's uh, normally if one country. I don't un understand why the Olaf Scholz uh, don't use the five article of NATO uh, in the time when the uh, uh, terrorist uh, uh, there was a terrorist attack to the Nord Stream pipe pipeline because it yeah. is the attack for the member of NATO. Normally, NATO may have to declare war against Norway and USA, but of course, <laughs> it's, it's a joke. <laughs> well, I think what the war is showing, you're right. I think the big winners in this war economically and strategically, if the war um, ends with some kind of a, a stalemate between Russia and and NATO is going to be the United States. But the United States is winning anyways compared to the European Union. You're absolutely right. European exports are going to become much more expensive. And they're not going to be competing very well against American, Chinese, and Japanese, and South Korean exports, electronics, industrial machinery, airplanes. All of those things are being more and more expensive in Europe because the energy costs have gone up in Europe because they have to import American gas, which comes from far away compared to Russian gas. So yes, you're right. Strategically, it is a good strategy for the American capitalist class uh, at the expense of the Europeans. That's for sure. Um, why Schultz did not invoke Article 5? Because no country in the European Union has political sovereignty. This is what this war has shown us. No country in the European Union, but maybe with the partial exception of Hungary, uh, and Switzerland, but I, well, Switzerland is a special case. But no country in the European Union, uh, with the exception of perhaps Hungary, has political independence as a nation state. They are basically colonies of the United States, which is true. Th this is what this war has shown. Um, and all these attempts by European uh, elites to create the European Union as sort of a counterpart, maybe to the United States, or maybe some kind of a way to bring alive the British Empire in a new way by, by uh, kind of making London the predominant financial center of Europe as a counterpart to Wall Street. All of these things have, have, uh, have failed. America has again shown the European elites that uh, they're basically nothing but colonized comprador bourgeoisie, as we would have said in the Marxist literature.
I would like now to ask about Bulgaria. Could you compare uh, so-called communist totalitarianism with modern freedom? How do you assess the balance of the political transformation? What can you say about Bulgarian demographics, economy and democratic freedoms? After all, is Bulgaria an independent country or are all important decisions made by the foreign centers? And if so, by what? Via Brussels or Washington? Mm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think if we ask the question, who benefited from the reconstruction of capitalism in Bulgaria from 1990 until 2023? And I would say a small part of Bulgarian society, maybe 1%, maybe 2%, let's say, uh, are certainly living better. You know, this is the class of the new kind of uh, political elites, as they say, in the new capitalist class, which enriched itself essentially through large-scale theft of uh, public properties in the so-called transition period from uh, socialism to capitalism. They're living much better. They're living wonderfully, right? They are uh, owners of most of the Uh, large corporations in Bulgaria, they, they play a leading role in, in, in the political life, and etc. So they live really well. But as a whole, the transformation of uh, Bulgaria from socialism to capitalism has been an incredible catastrophe for the average Bulgarian. First of all, there's a demographic um, outflow. About 3 million Bulgarians, two and a half to 3 million officially, have left the country more or less permanently, or they spend most of their time yearly uh, outside of Bulgaria. So the population of Bulgaria went from 9 million in 1989 to 6.5 million today, but closer to 6 million unofficially. So this is a catastrophic demographic collapse. Why? Because Bulgaria, I just read this very interesting article actually uh, that was published by the Cambridge Journal of Economics, so we cannot accuse it of being Marxist, but it's written by Hungarian, Russian, uh, and American scholars. It's called Deindustrialization and the Post-Socialist Mortality Crisis, and it studies Russia and Hungary specifically, and it shows that between 1991 and 1999, 7.3 million extra people, extra deaths happened across Eastern Europe because of the collapse of the Soviet Uh, of the socialist uh, economy. So in Bulgaria, deindustrialization of the economy was the most devastating along with in Russia and in Hungary. B Bulgaria doesn't have an industrialized economy anymore. It's basically a, a, a third world country, economically speaking, uh, consisting of a service economy, which with, with, with a very big, small shopkeeper sector, like petty bourgeois sector, a lot of shops by families that have a shop that sells, you know, uh, little things here and there. Uh, there are no Bulgarian-owned large heavy industries anymore. To the extent that they're industrial enterprises, they're very few and they're usually foreign-owned. And the Bulgarian economy can best be described as a post-industrial uh, subcontractor-based service economy. So the total deindustrialization of the Bulgarian economy caused Uh, life stand, living standards to go down very, very fast and very radically, which forced jobs to, it meant jobs disappeared and it forced a lot of Bulgarians to leave the country. So the end result is demographic collapse and mass impoverishment. Now, to the extent that Bulgarians, I'm sure the same as in Poland, to the extent that one of the interesting things in Bulgaria is what remained from the socialist period. What remain from the socialist period is almost every Bulgarian owns their own home. Most Bulgarians own their own homes. And this is not just the formerly bourgeois Bulgarians who received back their property confiscated by the communist government. No, this includes uh, all of the working class ordinary Bulgarians who during socialism uh, obtained their own apartments. And very often a, a village house as well, or a bungalow in a village in a, in a kind of a vacation area outside of cities. I'm sure it's the same in Poland. So one it of the was, interest, it was it was. So one of the interesting things about Bulgaria is that there's a very high level of home ownership, even though that's changing already. Because as people become poorer, 
their children might sell an apartment in order to get money and you know so in bulgaria i think post socialism is basically can be described by a couple of words mass impoverishment demographic catastrophe deindustrialization and uh, increasingly mass illiteracy among the young generation so it's a complete devastation i think on a national level i think compared to uh, it's as if bulgaria had some kind of a horrible war but it happened without a war so i think the end result is uh, bulgaria doesn't have political sovereignty it's it's a it's it's government its main political parties let's put it that way its main political parties gerb which is the main political party used to be the main ruling party until the last uh, two or three years is essentially a project of the west german social uh, christian democratic party i mean i'm just citing publicly known information uh, it was funded by the the G german government you know 10 to uh, 15 years ago to be like a center right party which was essentially orchestrated by the german government and the latest two parties the continuing change and yes bulgaria which are positioning themselves as liberal parties are essentially uh, pro american and they're american controlled under direct control they're literally directly from the us embassy this is kind of a joke in bulgaria where they journalists show videos of the heads of these parties leaving the embassy you know where they went to receive instructions so uh, bulgaria's government i would say is under direct foreign control in terms of its policy choices now that doesn't mean that there are no internal opposition parties there are and there are internal political figures that are uh, independent to a far greater degree like the current president for example we can argue but in general bulgaria's policies joining nato join the european union under conditions that were devastating to bulgaria's economy uh, closing the nuclear power plant or most of the reactors, which immediately placed Bulgaria under, uh, it threatened its energy independence. Bulgaria is completely energy independent if it wants to be, because it has a huge nuclear reactor, uh, stage power plant with six reactors. Uh, and since Bulgaria doesn't have heavy industry anymore, if all of those six reactors were working instead of only two of them, then Bulgaria would have essentially free or nearly free energy available to its citizens and, and uh, uh, industries. So the closure of the nuclear power plant, most of the reactors, all of these decisions that were the sale of its largest non-nuclear power generating plant to an American company for 30 years, all of these big policy decisions that were harmful for the Bulgarian state and the Bulgarian economy show that the Bulgarian political uh, the Bulgarian government at those periods was under direct foreign control in ways that harmed its national interests. And a lot of all Bulgarians understand this. You know, most Bulgarians understand this, you know, and, and this is talked about. <clears throat> you talked about war from the Poland perspective in the Second World War. Uh, Poland uh, have losses uh, 6 million of people from uh, 38 people. So we need to make calcul, but I think that it is, I don't know, 15%, something like this. Which is catastrophic. That's absolutely catastrophic. Yes, it's catastrophic, catastrophic yes. but you told about one third, one third loss of the population. Yeah. So, so, so the transform, the capitalism uh, transformation is more radical from the demographic losses than the Nazi occupation of yes. Poland. Yes, and I must add, almost nothing is made in Bulgaria now over the last, under capitalism, of any national significance. In other words, there are no new railroads made. They're barely starting to repair the national railroad now. There's no uh, heavy industry of any kind made, no new power plants, to the, there are no new schools made. If you look at the, at the number of schools that have been closed versus the number of schools that have been built, there are thousands of schools that have been closed, hospitals. There is nothing, you can argue that there is more highways were finished in Bulgaria now, but even those highway projects were started by the socialist government. So nothing of national, economic, and cultural, their cultural significance has been produced under 30 years of capitalism in Bulgaria. Nothing. 
I don't know if it's the same in Poland. Probably not, but I'm guessing. But in Bulgaria, it's been a complete disaster if you look at it that way in terms of the really important things like econ national economic and cultural uh, structures. No, the situation in Poland was similar in 1990s, but uh, because Poland became a member of European Union and from geographic perspective, we are uh, very close to the Germany. So the Poland is connected with uh, German economy. And uh, me, uh, like a guy who are living in France, and very often when I want to go to Poland, I take a car. I can say that the roads uh, from Germany to Poland are good. After when you when I my 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 family live in Warsaw, but my wife family lives uh, 120 kilometers from Warsaw. And if I want to go to 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 them, a small village in the Mazovia region, uh, it's terrible. The, the, there are not public transport, and the the the, the road are very. It's, it's, it's the third world. So you see this uh, uh, that we have two kind of the state. Uh, uh, some things very modern, which is to export to the Germans. And the uh, second part of Poland is the third state totally forgotten, forgotten and totally destroyed the, 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 the train station which existed in the socialist time. Now it's, it's closed. There are the woods there. The, the, it's nothing. That, and all the time they speak about the ecology and the uh, train uh, train uh, transport it was totally destroyed and this train uh, train uh, transport which exists today in poland it's uh, 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 in the time when in the socialist time you, from one city to another you for take for example two hours now you take four hours <laughs> and uh, it's uh, f 30 years later normally you need to make a more speed train but not in poland well that's an interesting point because it talks about internal <clears throat> uneven and unequal development within a country, not just between countries, like imperialism creates uneven and unequal development, right? The imperialist center is wealthy and uh, extracts all the resources from the periphery. But even within capitalist countries, we have uneven economic development, which was exactly the opposite of the socialist period, the so-called totalitarian period, because it totally developed the Polish rail network, right? Or the Bulgarian rail networks. It wasn't just the railroad between the largest cities that was well maintained. It was a concern to evenly develop all regions of the country instead of the regions that are closest to Germany. And so when we talk about totalitarianism, I joke with my American you know, Marxist friends, I said, yeah, there was a totalitarian approach to, the, to society, the total development of society or its, or its economic resources rather than, and the same thing in Bulgaria, you know, everything is concentrated in the capital Sofia. So Sofia has the largest amount of resources. It has the, you know, uh, a modern metro system. You know, the boulevards are, you know, well-maintained and et cetera. And then if you go to a large regional city, it's devastated. It's like a third world country. You know, the lights don't work, complete abandonment, lack of money, because everything and a lot of Bulgarians go to work in Sofia. Because it's, it's, it is like a third world phenomenon where in the colonized country, there's one or two big cities and 90% of the young people or the actual working people go there because that's where the jobs are from the, from the foreign companies around the airport, you know, they have office buildings, very nice, very beautiful. And then everybody, all the other cities, smaller cities, villages are completely abandoned. And I think that's the reality of uh, capitalism in Bulgaria as well. You know. uh, I would like to say that in 1970s, uh, the, uh, the, the, the leader of Poland, Edward Gerek, he made administrative reform and he, in Poland, we have 49 uh, small regions with 49 uh, cities, which are the capital of these regions. 
and it was very good for the development of the cities. Indeed, in every city, uh, they built hospital uh, factories, uh, some some opera in, theater uh, or or a concert yes, hall. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, uh, one of the uh, and in 1990s they uh, they make. Uh, another reform and from the 49 it's now it's 16 <laughs> and uh, so there are 34 the 34 the polish cities which uh, before it was the capital of the region and now it's totally forgotten yeah that's exactly and and or in bulgaria if you go to a small uh, city in the mountains in the southern mountains in the rudopi um, you could see if the city was not able to create tourism today with wine and, you know, et cetera, then there would be no jobs and the people would have to drive to the nearest big, bigger city. But in socialist times with this concern to do equal development of all the regions as much as possible, that city also had industries that were based in that city. So the local population, whether it was college educated or, not at college, you know, working class of some form could go and work in their own community instead of traveling far away. And it's the same idea I see with the Polish uh, regions, because if you become a regional capital, the more regional capitals you have, the more widespread the investment will become to equally develop all of those regions. And they would have similar levels of develop economic development. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Now let's talk about the radical left in the U.S. Uh, in the American two-party uh, two system, is uh, it is an entirely marginal force. American Marxists are unable to create an efficient, well-functioning party, nor are they able to break through with their slogans to American society. In my opinion, Marxism is pushed on the deep defensive and various new ideologies of an individualist nature are promoted in radical left organizations such as a wokeism, which I believe are incom incompatible with a socialist thought, which is by definition collectivist. Nevertheless, American Marxists tend to preach of, to Marxists of other countries and any revolutionary movement or existing socialist state is criticized. How can you explain it? Well, I mean, I think, I, 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 first of all, you're right, that in my observation as an outsider kind of in, in America, learning about America, America has had a, its own rich tradition of, um, of Marxists and Marxist organizations. And some of them have become big enough and powerful enough in history to affect national politics. And we can mention here briefly, obviously, the American Communist Party, Communist Party USA, which in the, up until the 1930s was a powerful force in American politics with, with a lot of members and playing a leading influence among American uh, intellectuals, uh, figures in Hollywood, uh, et cetera, and, what, and with strong unions. So for example, in the 1920s and 30s, the biggest union of teachers in America, the New York teacher union was a, a union of the Communist Party of the United States. And it managed to win a lot of important uh, kind of gains for its members. Or the Black Panther Party, for example, we can mention, which in the 60s for a brief period was seen by the uh, US government as, as a threat, number one threat, internal threat to, to national security because of its widespread uh, popularity among the most politically active part of America, the Black freedom movement, but also in its efforts to build alliances with white working class organizations. Of course, you know, in America, everything it has to go through the language of race as well, because as you know, racism is such a fundamental part of American identity, unfortunately, because it's used by the capitalist class to divide the working class. And, but I think since then, you're right, uh, the United States to this day, unlike other, unlike some European countries, it doesn't have a single working class party of national significance. There is no socialist party or labor party even 
in the United States that has national presence. There are very small parties that don't, unfortunately, don't have national effect. They have regional effect and local effect. So I think that's one of the problems. But of course, the real problem of American Marxism is that this is the center of empire. And because this is the center of empire, it's persecuted very harshly. American Marxists are, have been historically very violently suppressed by the state. That's the first problem. The second problem is American uh, individualism, you know, this liberal ideology that you mentioned that is so deeply ingrained uh, in, in American uh, kind of, uh, in the average American that the individual is more important than the, than the collective. And you, you can understand that because there are not many collective things that exist in America. You know, there is a pension by the federal government called social security, but that pension is not enough to live as a retiree. So everybody has to have a private pension, second pension that they are responsible as individuals for collecting and saving, just like they did the same thing in Bulgaria. The Bulgarian pension system is essentially based on the American system. I'm sure Polish system too has been neoliberal, you know. So I think America is a country of deep individualism. And as long as that liberal ideology of the, of the individual uh, is popular, it's going to be impossible for collectivist social thought to sink root in, in among millions of people. I mean, there are, but they're very small. Marxism is present on a very small level, unfortunately. And it's, and it's in academia. But a lot of those Marxists in academia are this, these kinds of fake uh, Marxists who are not really interested or supportive of any actually existing socialism. So they're not really, um, I, I would call them, they're more like lifestyle Marxists. You know, they, they like to read Marx and they teach Marx, but they, they don't really practice Marx, you know, Marx's ideas. So in the United States, we don't, there's not a single um, political organization, unfortunately, that exists on a national level that can win elections or that can get into Congress because of America's two-party system. Because as you know, in America during elections, it's simple majority. So if three parties participate in an election in America for, the, for Congress, uh, the party that, has a, that wins a simple majority of votes wins all of the seats, which is incredibly anti-democratic, right? There is no power, unlike many systems in Europe, you know, where you have proportional representation. In America, there is no proportional representation. So that makes it almost impossible for uh, a Marxist party or some kind, even some kind of a social democratic party uh, to win any elections on the national level. So the end result is American politics is totally dominated by the liberals, whether they're called conservative liberals, like the Republican Party, or whether, whether they are kind of global, um, the globalizing elites kind of liberals, which is the Democratic Party, you know. And, and those don't even care about the United States, you know. <laughs> the, the Democratic Party's uh, kind of political ideology doesn't really care about the American working class at all, even as as their workers, you know. Um. Yes, uh, you you talked about the reform in Poland of the pension. So in 1997, uh, there we had the um, prime minister. His name is Jerzy Buzek. He was the prime minister four years. And after he became the um, the leader of the parliament of the in the Strasbourg, uh, five years, um, and in 1999 he made a form four big reform. And the question is which uh, which reform was the worst for the Polish population? <laughs> First, I already said it was the administration reform, uh, so it uh, make poverty in these cities which became the uh, uh, which uh, are no longer the capital of the region. Second reform was the education uh, reform of the education. After there was the uh, reform of the uh, hospitals and we have the reform of the pensions so it was the privatization of the pension system and it was uh, uh, they copy this the reform which existed in the pinochet chile uh, <laughs> totally and it was totally catastrophe so even donald tusk when he became a prime minister 
after 10 years uh, he saw that uh, it's uh, we need to change this system because if not uh, the people will be um, w w without nothing in the time of the pension so, so they make some 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 uh, correction of this but it is uh, totally uh, is the system that uh, uh, in, in reality we don't have the the majority of the polish population don't have the pensions in this uh, in this way that even if you are in the age of 60 62 65 70 you need to work uh, you have some very very small money uh, it's good that you have some very small money to pay i don't know uh, some some medicaments but if you want to pay the other things you need to work and... you know it's interesting in terms of economy and <clears throat> Very soon, they're saying, if we read uh, predictions of the next 20 to 30 years by these big um, uh, management and advisement companies like Gartner, McKinsey, they have reports what's going to happen in the global economy. Now that artificial intelligence, there's this new development of computer technology mixed with roboticization in industrial workplaces. What is going to happen to jobs in Europe, in America, in Asia? And the European reports by McKinsey say in 20 to 30 years, 30% 30 of the European Union workforce will be permanently unemployed because we won't need them, right? Because of advancements in machines, replacing human workers and et cetera. And if you have governments like political systems like Poland or Bulgaria or most parts of European Union, which are arranged according to Chicago Economics Department, University of Chicago Economics Department, neoliberal logic, which was implemented in Pinochet's Chile and in Poland and Bulgaria and elsewhere. Uh, that, that, is, that is absolute stupidity because that logic of organizing pensions and economy is going to be, it doesn't make sense today. And, and in 30 years, it's not going to make sense at all because 30% of the workers, people of working age are not really going to be working according to these predictions. They're going to be replaced by uh, software and and uh, increasingly sophisticated robots. So, but nobody is talking about this in Poland or Bulgaria. Like, what's going to happen in the pension in the next ten years or fifteen years or next twenty years? How are we organized? Going to organize uh, the economy? And of course, if we look back in our own history, the Polish economic history, Bulgarian economic history, Soviet economic history, people in the nineteen sixties were already talking about. What's going to a better way of organizing economic production and consumption and decisions better than the capitalist theories and also the existing socialist theories of the Stalinist era, you know, the Gosplan with, you know. So in the Soviet Union, there was only now they're translating these works in English, but not really because the papers are still mostly in, in Russian and Ukrainian. There was a famous... Uh, cybernetics professor, economist by the name of Glushko, who was Ukrainian in Kiev. He, he worked in Kiev and in Moscow. In fact, you can go to the Glushko Institute's website in Kiev and download all of his papers. Um, and Glushko essentially invented the internet or, or an equivalent to the internet about 10 years before the Americans with ARPANET. And what was the difference between the Soviet Glushko's internet and the American ARPANET? ARPANET was, was designed to help the Pentagon uh, communicate effectively during nuclear war, right? So that's the beginning of the ethernet, the internet. The internet is distributed communication system. So you can send a message in more than one different way. The message can reach, I can send you a message and it can reach you in more than one way automatically. So if, if the phone line that I used to call you is blown up because the nuclear bomb exploded in Warsaw and there's no more telephone lines, the system will automatically find a way to route your message to you. That's basically how email works. So, uh, so the American internet was first of all a military technology, and then it was privatized. It became a capitalist technology, which it is now. It's a technology that's used for uh, to make a lot of money by large corporations. The Soviet internet was. Obviously, it had its military use, but its primary use was economic organization of society in a new way. Every point of, everywhere something was sold, every cashier 
register. You know, when you go to the store and you pay for something, they, the cashier gives you a receipt and takes your money. Every cashier register was going to be connected to the internet. And every time something was bought or sold in real time, the Soviet economy was going to receive real-time information connected to supply and demand. And that was going to be in real time sent to the various factories and production uh, facilities and everything else in the economy. So there was hopefully going to be as efficient as possible allocation of resources in this egalitarian way because it wasn't made in order to maximize profits for private owners of businesses, but for the entire economy of society as a whole. So they developed supercomputers. So Glushko uh, patented his own uh, supercomputer circuits. They came up with his own networking protocols. All of that stuff is either still classified or it was never built after the prototype stage. Right? Now, in Poland, what do we have? In Poland, we have Kalecki's research on centrally planned economies and cybernetics. Same thing. We have the same thing in Bulgaria. There was a Bulgarian uh, academician who was uh, communicating with Glushko and Kalecki and all that. So there's a rich history in Poland of what could be a cutting edge reorganization of the Polish economy using internet technologies, supercomputers, big data, but the political intention is completely different, right? From what it is today. So ironically, the backwards totalitarian authoritarian state has left us contemporary Polish, Bulgarian people uh, enormous intellectual uh, ideas and weapons, if you will, with which we can prepare this new world of where people don't have to work anymore as much, right? But let's do it not the way the capitalists are going to do it, because you can imagine how they're going to do it. It's not going to be good. <laughs> no. so, so that's an interesting side point that is almost never studied in the West at all. It's com I think, I think, Cold War era intelligence agencies were aware of Glushko's experiments and everybody read Mikhail's, uh, Kalecki's papers in Cambridge and it's in the British and American governments, I'm sure. But what I'm saying is a lot of work can be done by Marxist uh, intellectuals, workers, uh, journalists in trying to reconstruct some of these ideas and see which ones would be of revolutionary importance today. So these things enter our, our consciousness because all that stuff is, is buried under the ground and people don't even, we don't even know about it. It's our history. You know, everybody thinks the internet was invented by who? By the English professor and by a bunch of American universities. That's not true. That's the internet that we use, but that's one type of an internet that's possible that was invented. There were other inventions that were with totally different applications. Uh, it's just that they were not um, built because that system fell apart. You know? So, so that, that's a very interesting history, but that's a side, that kind of a side point. Um, um, so we are live and uh, there are some questions for you. I hope that you have, uh, you have time because there are a lot of questions. Uh, so maybe uh, the first question is, is Bulgaria a fallen country today, fallen state? Fallen state meaning how? Like a, like a failed state in that sense, the way it's used in the literature or? I think that yes, that the, uh, very often they, they, they use this, I, I don't know what is the tra translation to English, but the state like, like Ukraine. Or, uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I think Bulgaria is, it's a small country and I, I would say it's just like any other, it's first, I mean, let's analyze it objectively. Let's look at Bulgaria's current presence in the European, in the world economy. Let's look at its um, demographic dynamics. Let's look at its intellectual uh, dynamics, levels of uh, literacy, cultural life. Let's look at its uh, military. I mean, that's, one, uh, that's another way of measuring. Let's look at its average lifespan of its citizens. Let's look at its healthcare uh, statistics. And, and then we can get an understanding, education level, then we can get an understanding of where is Bulgaria. So if we look at these measurements, it's a mixed picture. So on one level, all Eastern European societies, and I think this is pretty much a, 
uh, consensus for people who study education, all Eastern European societies consist of highly educated populations. This is one of the, uh, in general, as a whole. This is uh, a general uh, after effect of the socialist system, which produced an average on average, right? We never talk about the elite universities because the elite universities are good in any country. We look at the average. So on average, Eastern European worker, workers uh, are very well educated on a, on a global comparison compared to the world. So the average workforce in, in Eastern Europe is, uh, is very well educated, um, but with a tendency to decline as the younger generations are being educated in the dysfunctional new education systems, which are essentially went the, the Bologna system or the American educational system, which is completely dysfunctional. I mean, I, I worked in the American education system, I know, with the exception of the elite universities, the American secondary education system is a complete disaster, you know, if you want to look at the measurements. So Bulgaria's education, uh, average uh, level of education is fairly high, which is a good thing. Uh, Bulgarian um, industrial performance, economic performance is a disaster. I'm not talking about the fake kind of measurements like inflation is fairly low, even though it's a little bit high now, that Bulgaria doesn't have a lot of debt. I'm looking at the, at the structure of the Bulgarian economy. Does it have any high-tech sectors that are Bulgarian-based? Not a single thing. Yes, Bulgaria has a lot of uh, computer programmers, but all of them work, not all, most of them work for directly for foreign companies or they work for Bulgarian companies who in turn serve foreign companies as subcontractors, which means most of the money, most of the pro economic profits leave the country. And most of the intellectual property is not owned by Bulgarians. Because if you work as a programmer in the Microsoft office in Sofia or HP's office in Sofia, the intellectual property belongs to HP, whatever you program in that office. It doesn't belong to. Uh, so it's a net, what they call net outflow flow um, of value. So Bulgaria is a deindustrialized economy. There's not a single Bulgarian uh, company, private company or state company uh, on a, of a European scale, except the military state companies that are selling weapons to Ukraine. So the Bulgarian economy compared to where it was 30 years ago is completely deindustrialized. That's not good. That's, that's a sign of failure. Because with, without, a, in, without a high tech, so what makes an economy today a viable economy? L look at South Korea, look at Japan, look at China, look at any of the wealthier economies in the world, the United States, Western Europe, um, parts of the Russian economy as well. High tech economies, C cybernetics, you know, computer technology, uh, pharmaceuticals, aircraft, aerospace technologies, robotics. With very small exceptions, uh, Bulgaria does not play a leading role in any of those industries anymore. Until 1989, Bulgaria was the third largest producer of hard drives in the world, the largest in Europe, out after the United States and Japan. Bulgaria was the third largest producer of external hard drives. It's almost shocking to believe that. So Bulgaria had a computer uh, hardware industry up until 1980, it doesn't now. So by those measurements, heavy industry, does Bulgaria have an automobile industry that's natively based? Are there any Bulgarian companies that produce um, cars? No. There are subcontractors that produce parts, but again, these are foreign owned companies where all of the intellectual property and most of the profits leave the country, it's the economy. So by that measurement, the Bulgaria is a failed state. Right? In the sense that it doesn't have an, a, an independent economy because those things that make up an independent economy, a high-tech uh, value-added sector, as they say, is not present in the country. Does it have a healthcare system that functions well? No, unfortunately. Bulgaria had an advanced pharmaceutical industry, which was an exporter, global exporter, uh, until 1990. Uh, today, it has a very, very small pharmaceutical industry by comparison. And most of the advanced pharmaceuticals that treat cancer, you know, the most difficult diseases, which are very expensive drugs because they're very high tech drugs, monoclonal antibodies, um, nuclear medicine, et cetera, all of that stuff is important. 
because Bulgaria's pharmaceutical industry doesn't have the ability to produce. Bulgaria's pharmaceutical industry can produce cheap antibiotics. It can produce cheaper, uh, older drugs, uh, but it has lost the ability to produce um, the cutting edge of medicine today. So in that sense, again, unfortunately, it's a failed state as well. So these things are extremely difficult to say because it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, but it is. Does Bulgaria have the ability to produce railroad equipment, which is another measurement of um, kind of a well-functioning state because that's a strategic resource. The production of railroad equipment, uh, railroad uh, cars for freight trains, passenger trains, locomotives. No, it has lost that ability as well. So uh, does it have a shipbuilding industry? Not anymore. There, there's small-scale ship production, but it doesn't have a large shipbuilding industry that produces ships for exports on a large scale, it doesn't have that either anymore. That's been destroyed as well. So essentially it is a failed economy. It survives because of uh, foreign capital investments that use Bulgarians as cheap labor. Just the way the United States uses Mexico uh, as, as a place for cheap labor, or I guess Germany uses Poland, you know, for cheaper labor. Uh, it's very pessimistic what you said. Uh, I'm pessimistically optimistic, but you know I'm optimistic about the future. <laughs> yes, but it is pessimistic from this perspective that for Marxists the, the 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 number of the working class population is important, and. Uh, if we see the industrialization and, and the growing population of the working class, it can make us pop, uh, optimistic because it will be the force uh, which will defeat the capitalist system. But in the desindustrialization, uh, it's, uh, it's terrible because uh, it will be capitalism without force which can destroy capitalism. And to add to your extremely important point, I think we have to make the difference between working class people who are actively working. Yes, they're being exploited, but they are working and thus they are skilled. They're actually producing value versus proletarianized working class. So I think what we have in countries like Bulgaria or any other Eastern European country, we have, a, we have the proletarianization of the working class. And what does it mean to be a, a person who is now a proletariat? Technically, it means you have, you're going through a process of loss of ability because when your services are no longer needed and you are a skilled nuclear engineer or if you are a, a skilled machinist in a plant that made railroad locomotives and you assembled locomotives for 10 years and you were a skilled worker of that kind and now the factory closed because of privatization and deindustrialization and you are no longer working as a locomotive assembly technician, but are now a taxi driver, because that's what you have to do to make a living, you are now have become proletarianized. You are living by not taking advantage even of your skills as a working class person. And that's a very difficult, that's a major political regression. And that's what's happening. This is part of the reason why their unions are weak across Eastern Europe and, and the working class is kind of in a situation of shock. This is a gen these are generations of people, especially the older generations, but even us, who are in a state of shock. They're in a state of loss. They have lost their way of living, and we've become proletarianized. We've lost the ability to function even as a working class. So, it's yes, in that sense, that is the, the difficulty of, of, of uh, reassembling working class politics. It's going to happen, of course. It's just that maybe this period, the last 30 years, is the worst period that we're living through of this kind of a breakdown of working class abilities and solidarities and lifestyles. The proletariat is the marginal worker, the worker who has been detached from even functioning as a working class person in a real sense. Yes, he or she's functioning as a working class person, as a taxi driver, but I'm, now I'm functioning as an individual in my own car that I may be... I work as a subcontractor to some other small business. I don't have the solidarity of working in a place of work with 300 other people. My politics will be affected. I'm marginalized, I'm isolated, right? I, I, et cetera. 
What's your opinion on socialist self-management in your communist Yugoslavia? I have a theory that I cannot prove. I have a theory that if the communist party elites of Bulgaria and Poland and Soviet Union did not decide to become capitalist and essentially uh, transform themselves into the new bourgeoisie and steal uh, the wealth of the, uh, of the national economies. I think if they opened the borders in Bulgaria and Poland, just the way Yugoslavia did, so Bulgarians and Polish people perhaps could go and see the West and maybe work there and maybe become workers in America for six months uh, to make money so they can buy you know, a nice Japanese television and, you know, everything else that they wanted, consumer goods, all of them would come back or 95% of them would come back because they would see what life under capitalism is. So I think the socialist self-management in communist Yugoslavia was, I think, um, a very good idea and a very good practice. And I think it was a very good antidote to the, the capitalist consumerist propaganda because Yugoslavia, Yugoslavs could travel back and forth to the West. They could work, they could come back, they could study, they could come back. And I think if that happened in large scale on, this, on, the, on the Eastern Bloc, millions of Eastern Europeans would have seen what capitalism is and a lot of them would have come back. And thus the, the intellectual anti-communism would have become much weaker. Because I think, I speak for myself, when I went to become a student in America after socialism fell apart in the, in the Soviet system in Bulgaria and the Soviet Union, because I have relatives in the Soviet Union as well on my mother's side. So I'm, I'm half Soviet and half Bulgarian in that sense. Um, I couldn't believe what I saw in the United States as a college student. For the first time in my life, when I went to New York, I saw homeless people sleeping in the streets. I mean, I read about that in school books because they taught us about that. We didn't believe it. We thought it was propaganda. I saw homeless people. I saw other college students who were homeless, my friends. I saw people getting shot and robbed in the subways, in the metro in New York. I saw the cost of living. I understood that most people in New York who have a house have, a, uh, have to borrow money from the bank and they have to pay 15 to 20%, 30% of their paycheck to the bank every month in order to, I saw things that I couldn't even believe and I didn't like any of them. I didn't even realize those things are possible that people could go to the doctor and then, or not go to the doctor because they can't pay for the doctor. I, I, still, I still don't understand that. I still don't understand that. How is that possible that you can't go to the doctor because you don't have money? But in America, that's normal. 20% of the American population can't go to the doctor because they don't have money to pay for surgery if they need to, gonna, or they have to sell their house. So I think, I think Eastern Europeans welcomed capitalism without knowing anything about capitalism. That's the tragedy. And when they learned about capitalism, it was too late. I think that's the real problem <laughs> that happened uh, in Eastern Europe. No, my father used to say, when he was alive, he used to say this every year, he used to say, we thought that when capitalism took over Bulgarian companies, my, he said, my factory would be now called Ford, like Ford Motor Company. We would change our clothes and our clothes would say Ford and nothing else will change except we'll make more money and we'll be able to travel everywhere. That's how he thought capitalism is. Nothing will change, meaning nothing will change in his factory where they had, nobody worked really that hard in the 1980s in socialist factories compared to capitalist factories. I know that for, that's an empirical fact. They had their lunch room, their lunch break, which was an hour, but it usually became two hours. Uh, you know, they had their sports team. They played ping pong. So every two weeks, he used to travel with the ping pong team on some worker tournaments to Czechoslovakia, to Poland, to Hungary. So the rate of exploitation or the rate of, of labor in late socialist factories was far less than capitalist factories in America, for example. So, but they didn't know that. They thought that if capitalism came to, to Bulgaria, all of these factory workers would work exactly the same way they worked, except it's gonna, they're going to make more money and they're going to be able to travel everywhere they want. And instead, the first thing that happened is everybody got fired. Yes, so. This is the, the history of the Gdansk shipyard. The, yeah, the, the soli, uh, soli, you know, Solidarnost, <laughs> right? I mean, the, yeah. Yeah. They make a strike to all be an unemployed person after the reconstruction of capitalism. 
In fact, Monthly Review Press published a book by a famous Solidarity member. I forget his name, but he was one of the far on the left. And the book was, he was an economist, famous economist. And it's published in English before Modzelewski? he died. Maybe. And he was very critical. He said, Solidarity, this is not what I fought for. Or this is not what we fought for. It was something like that, the book. And he shows how the solidarity workers' protests were very skillfully exploited over time to turn them into something that they were completely the opposite of what they, uh, what they were about in the beginning. Bulgaria under Zhivkov seemed as quite a prospering state. Was there any action similar to Kader's new economic mechanism? Yes, there were several. In fact, more books are coming, ironically, by American scholars uh, about Bulgaria's uh, socialist economy under Zhivkov. The interesting thing about Bulgaria was the Bulgarian Communist Party had the highest level of legitimacy probably in Eastern Europe because it won the first, the first post-socialist elections. It won by a huge majority, right? So that's a particular part of the tragedy in Bulgaria because um, some of those very same Bulgarian uh, senior Communist Party members of the younger generation then became the biggest Democrats and anti-communists in Bulgaria today. You know, the, the, the Bulgaria, unlike Poland or Hungary or East Germany or Czechoslovakia, <laughs> uh, did not have any organized opposition on a national scale that was anti-communist uh, under Zhivkov. Not a single organization. The first organizations that were oppositional were formally created in 1988, 1989. Yes, there were opposition, people who were disagreed with the government's policies, who were intellectuals, people as individuals, as small groups, and et cetera. But Bulgaria had no large-scale organized opposition within the Bulgarian Socialist Party, similar, for example, to what happened in uh, Hungary or Poland or Czechoslovakia. Why? Because the Bulgarian uh, Communist Party under Zhivkov, but also generally speaking, was incredibly successful at modernizing Bulgaria. And this is something that probably is not very clearly understood, but compared to Hungary, compared to Poland even, and definitely compared to Czechoslovakia or Czech, you know, Czechia or let's say the former parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Bulgaria was a backward, economically backwards uh, society in 1944. It was basically an agricultural society with huge levels of illiteracy, the majority of the population lived uh, in villages and engaged in basically subsistence agriculture and small crafts, uh, kind of uh, petty bourgeois uh, crafts, uh, artisanal production with very few factories. Bulgaria was not an industrial, industrialized society before the socialist period. Whereas Hungary was, uh, Czechoslovakia was, and Poland was. I mean, Poland produced its own airplanes its own tanks, Poland produced heavy machinery. Hungary was an industrialized society, it produced locomotives, everything. Same thing for Czechoslovakia. So what, what the economic transformations under uh, Zhivkov's uh, government fundamentally modernized Bulgaria and basically did what the Chinese Communist Party did in the last 40 years on a much greater scale. It brought the Bulgarian society into 20th century life in the good sense of the term. Modern agriculture, mechanized modern industrial scale agriculture, industry, mass literacy, more universities were built in Bulgaria between 1950 and 1989 than ever before. Before 1944, Bulgaria had like three universities, none of which were on the European level. Afterwards, there was a massive explosion of, of healthcare. So it's there were several new economic mechanisms like uh, programs under Zhivkov, which created, uh, essentially, Bulgaria was the 26th most industrialized or 25th most industrialized society uh, in the world in 1989, which by Bulgarian standards, it's never been higher. Right? So, so in that sense, for any of the contemporary anti-communist demagogues, most of whom were communists before 1989, to say publicly that they, Bulgaria was a backward state, yes, perhaps backward economically compared to who? Compared to uh, the United States, compared to Germany, compared to the Soviet Union, compared to 
Czechoslovakia, sure. But Bulgaria was a modern industrial state uh, with a highly literate uh, population in, in 1989, whereas none of those metrics were improved since 1989. So, so they're basically uh, just demagogues. But to answer your question, yes, there were several reforms like that. And I should just add this very quickly. The last reform, which was not finished, was that under Zhivkov's uh, last reform, the idea was Bulgaria to become the Bulgarian industry to become focused on high-tech computer production. So the idea was South Korea, Taiwan, China. That was the model. So Bulgaria was supposed to be transitioned into the production of personal computers, which already started in the 1980s, uh, microprocessors, computer peripherals, robotics, and um, cell phones. So that was the, 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 the last five-year plan from 1990 or until 95 was supposed to transition the Bulgarian economy into the production of cell phones because that was, you know, because, so <laughs> instead, you know, 3 million people left the country, 30% of the population left the country. Yeah. And second question about Bulgaria. How Bulgaria avoided the contradiction of accelerated development similar to economic course in Polish under Gerek and Ceausescu Romania, both resulting in a huge crisis? Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember uh, Ceausescu's program because I remember with my parents driving through Romania in the mid 80s. And while the roads and the infrastructure was very well maintained, there was almost very difficult to find anything to buy in supermarkets, for example, in stores, because everything was geared for its exports to pay down the national debt. Um, Bulgaria's economic policy was much more balanced. And I think the balance was achieved with some kind of a combination of Bulgaria did have foreign debt that it owed the capitalist world, capitalist bankers as well. So Bulgaria had a accepted under social, under Zhivko's period, accepted carrying a some fair amount of foreign debt along with um, uh, export focused economies. But Bulgaria also did something under Zhivkov, which was very um, clever from the Bulgarian national economic point of view, although it may seem a little bit uh, kind of um, like a little black marketeering. What the, what the Zhivkov government did by taking advantage of his close relationship with the Soviet government up until Gorbachev, with Gorbachev, everything fell apart, uh, was that Zhivkov, uh, Bulgaria signed trade agreements with the Soviet Union for kind of semi-official, semi-unofficial re-export of uh, Soviet oil to Turkey and the third world. So you have to remember, up until the 1980s, Turkey was an underdeveloped state compared to Bulgaria. So it's the, it's the reverse now. Turkey now is a dynamically growing economic powerhouse from which Bulgaria imports food, industrial material, construction, etc. But up until 1989, it was the reverse. Bulgaria was the more economically advanced society, which was often exporting. So anyways, so what Bulgarian government would do in the 70s and 80s, starting with the late 60s, but definitely in the 70s and 80s, they would import cheap Soviet oil, very, very cheap, bought at highly subsidized prices in rubles. And Bulgaria would keep some of that oil and refine it on, in its... There's a huge refinery next to Burgas on the Black Sea, which the Soviet Union built. It's the largest on the Balkan Peninsula. But that refinery would refine some of the oil for the Bulgarian industry. But a big part of this cheap Soviet oil would be refined uh, and or unrefined, re-exported to other uh, markets for dollars. Right? And then with those dollars, Bulgaria would import uh, whatever it needed to import from the non-socialist market. So the Bulgarian economy had this multi-level, I mean, maybe it was similar with the Polish and the, and the Hungarian economy as well. I, I don't know the details, but the Bulgarian economy had this source of cheap, uh, but yet extremely valuable uh, economic commodities that it could re-export almost as it wished to a certain extent with which to obtain kind of a level of freedom of movement in terms of its economic uh, decisions. And all of that it was possible because of Zhivkov's diplomatic strengths as a statesman, basically, you know. Um, so, yeah. What was the policy of the leaders of the People's Republic of Bulgaria towards the Turkish minority? 
Yeah, so that's the problem. So, okay, so Bulgaria has a sizable Turkish minority, about 15% of the population, 10 to 15. Of course, there's also the Roma population, which a lot of it self-identifies uh, with an affinity, either religious or with uh, the Turkish minority, although they're not Turkish, they are a distinct group. Um, but Bulgaria has a sizable Turkish minority, and this has to do with the fact that Bulgaria was for 500 years part of the uh, Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire, like any of those uh, non-Western imperial formations to which we can add the Russian Empire, the Persian Empire, uh, were multinational, multi-ethnic in ways that uh, preserved the ethnicity. You know, it's very, it's very interesting. After the British Empire colonizes parts of Africa, it's, it's very difficult to reconstruct the historical memory or genealogy of the colonized people. It requires a lot of work. But the Bulgarians, after 500 years of uh, Ottoman rule, you know, coexisted uh, with, uh, you know, so there's a sizable Turkish minority in Bulgaria. Now, since Bulgarian independence, as a result of the Russia-Ottoman uh, War of 1878, the new Bulgarian state actually obviously reasserted its national sovereignty. So over the last 150 years, there have been large-scale movements of Turkish people from Bulgaria to Turkey and Bulgarians from regions that have become, uh, you know, the Turkish Republic, especially after World War I, into Bulgaria. But nonetheless, Bulgaria has a sizable Turkish minority. Now, what happened was in the 1980s, there was a period of about five years where the People's Republic of uh, Bulgaria's government engaged in the forced, uh, essentially in a forced assimilation uh, program where Turkish Bulgarians had to change their names to Bulgarian names. The argument was that a lot of those people are ethnic Bulgarians who were uh, acquired Islam and their Turkish uh, names forcefully under Ottoman rule. And there is a lot of truth to that. Yes, that did happen because the Ottoman government in the 19th century also engaged in this kind of uh, forced ethnic... Um, reclassification, if you will. But the fact is, these people are self-identified as Bulgarians of Turkish descent, and they did forcefully, their names were changed, or a lot of them immigrated. In the late 80s, the borders were opened, and they were immigrated. But what precipitated that problem? What precipitated that problem was Turkish, there was a series of coups in Turkey as well, at that time, in the late 70s. And what precipitated that time, that, that um, uh, forced assimilation program was Turkish destabilization of Bulgaria through its Turkish minority. That happened as well. So what was happening in, in Bulgaria in the late 70s to the 1980s was Turkish government destabilization, attempted destabilization of Bulgarian uh, society through, you know, infusion of Turkish government resources, secret agents, um, money, resources were transferred in order to ask for, for example, increased Turkish autonomy, uh, self-determination, etc. Essentially, they were pushing the envelope. Of course, this doesn't justify, I mean, I personally don't think that should have happened. I, I don't think uh, the change of names should have happened. Um, I think that was a form of, of uh, kind of uh, ethnic nationalism that was not really compatible with where Bulgaria had been going up until that time. So um, I, think, I think this kind of Turkish destabilization of Bulgarian society could have been handled differently, perhaps by opening the borders and people could leave for Turkey if they didn't find Bulgaria to be a good place to live as Bulgarian Turks and et cetera. But that did happen. So there was a period where um, during the People's Republic, there was a forced assimilation of uh, Turks of uh, Bulgarians of Turkish ancestry. But this did not happen, even though I'm against this move and I, I, I'm critical of it. Uh, we must also face that this didn't happen purely internally through some kind of an internal nationalist kind of uh, uh, turn, but it did happen in the context of response to Turkish uh, destabilization. How do we know this? A lot of these documents, but not all of them, have been declassified in the 1990s, the state security, where you can read 
the intelligence reports about the declassification and also Turkish reports and, and CIA reports and et cetera. But yeah, that was not a good, um, that was not a good situation because it created a lot of internal strife. It created domestic terrorism. Uh, a train was blown, two trains were blown up. It was not good. In 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 Belarus, they lived one million uh, citizen of Belarus, which are origin of Polish, and they speak Polish. And before uh, in the Soviet Union and in the uh, in the in the Belarus also they have possibility to to learn Polish is school, uh, but unfortunately this Polish minor, minority was used by the Polish government and it was forced, uh, the, the NATO countries forced Poland to use the Polish minority in Belarus to anti-Ukashenko activity. And, uh, and uh, there are two organizations on, of Polish minority in Belarus. One is officially uh, and this official organization collaborated with President Lukashenko. And the second uh, is a split from this first organization, which is contra-revolutionary, financed the uh, puppet of the, of the Polish government. And this example, there was one citation, I, I, I forget it by whom, uh, but from some American that... Mm -hmm. If if we have some some big minority minority in Belarus uh, for the NATO country state, we it's it's uh, we need to use it because uh, it's a uh, it, it's a sin sin not to use this 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 minority to the. Uh, do you think that these uh, these problems with the Turkish minority of Bulgaria is all also was pushed by the NATO to to all this uh, strategy to destroy the socialist bloc by the na nationalism because destruction of Yugoslavia destruction of the Soviet Union it was from not for the. Uh, reconstruction of capitalism, but it was in the n n national question of Lithuania, of yeah. the... It's 100% true that the, we know for a fact that the Turkish government tried to destabilize Bulgaria through using uh, the ethnic minority problem, just the way the Polish state tries to... Or NATO, but really, when we say Turkish or Polish, we say NATO because they are members of NATO. So, yes, absolutely, that was a way to uh, precipitate a wider political crisis in the Soviet bloc. And by the way, I just want to say two things here that are, I think are very important to, uh, uh, to, in this conversation and maybe are perhaps less well-known, especially for Western audiences, is that the Soviet Union, the Soviet period of Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian history, whatever, created a new form of a national identity called a Soviet person. So, for example... Many people today in Russia, I'm sure in Ukraine or Belarus, especially in the older generation, my generation and older, like if they were to ask me, I could say, yes, like on my, like my mother's side, what is she? Yes, we can go and do the national breakdown because my mother is Ukrainian, Russian background. Maybe there's some Armenian there as well, but who knows? But, she's, but how does she identify? If you really push her, she say, I'm Soviet. Soviet identity, that was a national identity. That was a particular type of a person that emerged, which was educated and socialized in the Soviet Union. Yes, they could be of Russian background. They could be of identifies Ukrainian kind of ancestry, Azerbaijani, Chechen. But the point was, and this project was not fully successful, obviously, but for millions of people, it succeeded. And millions of people identify in that part of the world as Soviet. I just watched a video of a Ukrainian uh, cab driver on the internet from Odessa, and he was driving a car and the cab, and there was a young uh, Ukrainian woman, and she said, they were communicating, she says, why are you talking to me in Russian? That's the language of the occupier, right, because of the war. He said, what are you talking about? She said, I'm Soviet. She said, I was born in the Soviet Union in Odessa. I speak Ukrainian and Russian, and I grew up in the Soviet Union. That's my first passport. I'm a Soviet person. Your distinctions don't make sense to me. So that's true for millions of people. So I think one way to, to cut across, and same thing for Bulgaria. You can, in Bulgaria, obviously, 
it, the national identity is much stronger because we're Bulgarians. You know, we're not part of a, this confederation of, of other states like the Soviet Union was. But we're going to say, well, I'm Bulgarian, but there is such a thing as a Bulgarian socialist identity. The, the people who, who, the typical people who grew up and lived in that area were tend to be well-educated. They tended to be valuing scientific rationality. They tended to be fairly well knowledgeable about what's happening in the world. They tended to have kind of a general curiosity about reading and ideas. You know, today there's a different type of a, a personality because personality, these kinds of social personal types are correlated to the political and economic system under which you grow up in today. And under capitalism, most people talk about money. Like if you go on the streets in, in America, in Bulgaria, in Poland, and you listen to people's conversation, it's probably going to be something connected about paying the bills. Uh, my job is not paying me enough money, or I got a new job that's amazing, or I bought a new car. My car payments are pretty good. I'm excited about that, right? And under socialism, people talked about different things because it was a different type of a, uh, ideology. And they didn't talk about money in that same way. They talked about other things. So these are things that get lost in the history, but are of extreme importance. But to go back to the nationalism, I think a good way to avoid getting into destructive right-wing nationalist, proto-Nazi, proto-fascist, biologically grounded racist nationalisms, like there's something essential about the Polish race or the Ukrainian or the Russian race or the, you know, whatever, is to cut through with this thing called the social Soviet Soviet citizen, right? I mean, this is easier in, to be done in the former Soviet Union in Belarus than it is maybe in Poland and Bulgaria. But in Belarus, it's very easy to say, uh, yeah, what does it mean to be Belarusian today? It means to be, it means to uh, integrate the best aspects of what it means to be a Soviet person with all the best things that we can come up with after that period in our history. And if you do that on the level of your government national ideology, you will basically uh, make narrow racist nationalisms uh, marginal, meaningless, right? Because that's the problem I think that Russia is facing in the Ukraine now too, because the Ukrainian government is very clearly, has a clear I national identity of what does it mean to be Ukrainian and, and what kind of a Ukraine to fight for. Ukrainian for Ukrainians. Ukrainian language means the Western Ukrainian dialect from Galicia, which has nothing to do with the Eastern Ukrainian or the Southern Ukrainian spoken mixed with Russian and et cetera, et cetera. No, modern Ukrainian identity is Western Ukrainian identity, which has the shortest historical presence in Ukraine, if in Ukraine, the territory itself, because it was under Austro-Hungarian rule for most of its 19th century evolution, where it came from, including the flag, right? So the flag of Ukraine was invented by the Austro-Hungarian uh, empire in the context of its imperial competition against the Russian empire. It's nothing to do with the history of Ukraine w east of the historically Polish regions of, of Western Ukraine. I mean, there's no other way to talk about it, right? But it's a nationalist defined through racial terms, national identity that's very clearly defined. That's it. The Russians are in trouble in that sense, because what is modern Russia today? It has the Russian imperial uh, two-headed uh, you know, national insignia, but it has the red star of the Soviet Union and its military vehicles. Russia's national identity is not settled right now. Be why? Because the formerly liberal Russian national elites right now have to redefine themselves as Soviet if they want to win. They can't win otherwise against NATO. I mean, they can win the war against Ukraine because it's a smaller country, but they will not be able to prevail ideologically against the racist uh, Western NATO narrative because the NATO in the European Union sees Russia as Asiatic people. I mean, you, you cited those people. There are others. The German economics minister, I believe it was three, four months ago, said these people are not like us. They are, you know, there are a lot of comments. Borrell, everybody outside of the European Union is a bunch of the jungle. But this is the idiot who's the foreign minister of the European Union. This, this person who belongs in like... A, he should be as far away from government as possible. He belongs in jail, really, because he's a racist, imperialist, warmonger. But anyway. Um, but wait, so wait, wait. <clears throat> from this racist perspective, there, there is also another word that when there was a discussion uh, in the first days of the war and there was the big wave of the refugees from, from Ukraine, 
uh, and in Poland we have we had also the problem in the um, uh, border with Belarus and in border with Belarus there were the migrants from the uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria and other countries bombarded by NATO and uh, and Poland the government didn't want this to uh, open borders for these migrants but they open borders for the Ukrainian and in the in the uh, French television one guy said they are like us they are like us it's it's named that they are white uh, they are cr christian so this this from ukraine we can take but no this from iraq of afghanistan no they are not like us uh, yeah and but if those ukrainian refugees if they stay too long in france then all of a sudden they're not going to be white very quickly too probably right they're going to they're going to kick them back but you're absolutely right there's this is the this, you know, people have said that wars expose the truth in an ideology. And this war, which hopefully will stop as soon as possible because this is unbelievable loss of life, in that part of, the, of Europe, which, was, which achieved so many incredible achievements towards a wiser, better future, a life without stupid divisions according to class and according to racist nationalisms, that part is being destroyed. So, which is, I mean, this might sound like a conspiracy theory, but part of me always wonders was that this push to force Ukraine and Russia into killing each other, was this really an attempt to finally destroy whatever is left from the Soviet epoch, physically to destroy it? I mean, that's why they're destroying the monuments too, you know? It makes no sense for the Ukrainians to be destroying Soviet monuments of Ukrainians who died in World War II. Ukrainians who died in World War II, their monuments are being destroyed in Ukraine. I don't think Ukrainians are making those decisions to do that. I think those decisions are being made in Berlin and London a lot more than they're being made in, in Kiev. I think those are decisions made by the, by the uh, survivors of the defeated Nazis of 1945 who want to destroy any memory of their previous defeat. You know, I, I can't imagine Ukrainians uh, destroying the, their own statues of their own war veterans. You know, I think this is a dictation. This is something that's dictated from Berlin and London rather than from, from, uh, from but anyways, that's, that's a side point. So I think, this, I think if Russia does not reanimate some kind of a Soviet national identity, which cannot happen without a fundamental revolutionary change in their society, um, which I think Belarus is far closer to, um, I just don't think how they can sustain themselves uh, ideologically. Because you can't say it, we're fighting just for we're fighting for our own land. And no, that's that land for 90 years had a name. It was called um, Soviet Union. And millions of people subscribed to that with no problem. Not everybody, but the vast majority did. How do we know that? How do we know that most Ukrainians believed in the Soviet project? Because most of them fought for the Red Army and not against it. Ukraine was mostly occupied completely occupied by the Nazi-led European uh, invaders in World War II, it's important to say the Nazi-led European invaders. It wasn't just the Germans. It was completely occupied for three years, more than three years. Yet most Ukrainians who fought in World War II fought against the Nazis. What does that mean? That means most Ukrainians in that period, and thus their, their children as well, uh, consider themselves Soviet Ukrainians. That's extremely important not to be lost in the history of all this. Um. Okay, I will read uh, the comments and the questions all together because we need to finish and uh, answer or comment what, uh, what you want and after, uh, because... Uh, the, the, uh, okay, so one comment is uh, why did the anthem of the People's Republic of Bulgaria change so many times between 1946-1964? In the Russian language, somebody, uh, Kamrat Evgeny, write uh, in the YouTube lesson, Alexeya Safronova, uh, step uh, to the... Uh, step in the cyber, cyber communism, computers and planning in... Uh, the USSR steps towards cyber communism, computers, and uh, yeah. Uh, 
There is a problem is many Marxists have poor knowledge of mathematics in my experience. So the work of Glushko and Kalecki remain unknown <clears throat> among leftists learn higher mathematics Marxist. <clears throat> there is a comrade from Saludos Camarada from Chile. Um, question what do you think about the hypothetical supranational political organism connecting the countries with socialist past in eastern europe since our problems are mostly the same uh, is there any chance of socialism coming back to bulgaria Uh, true Eastern Europeans thought they would be enjoying Western capitalism who will still enjoy benefits of socialist system. Uh, uh, Bulgarian comrades hadn't read Marxism and national question by comrade Stalin. Uh, thoughts on Transnistria. <laughs> Very glad to see Bulgarian communists. Part of my family are Bulgarian. There is not absolute anti-communist lies that wouldn't they wouldn't repeat. They are very anti-Sovietic and anti-Russian. Uh, uh, they are refugees and migrants. You can distinguish them by their skin of color. Uh, so mm. the, the the white is refugees, the migrants are from <clears throat> not, not white. Um, smart content comrades, good stuff. Okay, so so it will be yeah, it's it's very good all, but... questions. Yeah, I, I will try to answer some of them <clears throat> because they're all so interesting. I mean, I mean, I don't know the answer to the question about the anthem. I'm sorry. <laughs> I yeah, I I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, to uh, about the Safronov, uh, Kiber communism is, uh, yes, I totally agree. I think the technological legacy, techno-scientific legacy of the Soviet Union is not understood very well in general. It's probably understood very well by um, uh, imperialists like intelligence agencies and related Uh, scientific research facilities. But it's true that under the Soviet Union, there was a massive explosion of universities and academic life in the Soviet Union. And when it comes to cybernetics, which is the science behind all computer science, uh, the revolutionary uh, developments of uh, academic Glushko and, and others in the Soviet Union have not been realized yet. And I think a lot of Russian... Uh, Ukrainian and ge generally post-Soviet scholarship is being done on this now, but it's not, it, more needs to be done. Yeah, so I'm going to watch that, uh, that lecture uh, on YouTube for sure. I'm very interested in this because I think technology is everywhere in modern capitalism. Obviously, it hasn't been since the beginning of capitalism. Capitalism, somebody defined it as the fusion of Galilean science and the economic techniques of the capitalist class, you know. Anyways, but but the latest technological explosion, the latest phase, which is the use of uh, general purpose computer machinery that's networked and, you know, big data, and now with applications to, to machine learning and natural language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of this stuff is meaningless if it's used in the capitalist economy because it's going to be used to... Uh, essentially further the political and economic interests of the capitalist class, we know what's going to happen. Whatever happened with the internet technology in the last 30 years and how it's used. But if we look at Glushko and, 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 and cyber, cyber communism, if the political accent is completely different and it's not capitalist, and the questions of economic organization of a socialized or some type of egalitarian redistributive economy that's highly industrialized and computer network connected. That's a revolutionary uh, problem. That's a revolutionary and exciting uh, way forward. That, that should be one of the things that's studied by contemporary communists uh, very intensely. Just to go back to the other comment by the comrade who said that Marxists today don't study higher mathematics, I completely agree. And this is connected to the question of understanding the Soviet uh, cybernetic legacy. Not just cybernetics, you know, there were amazing experiments with cold fusion 
in the Soviet Union as well in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, which were shut down by the Soviet government because oil was becoming very expensive at that point. So there was less incentive to work on cold fusion and more incentive to work on developing the newly discovered oil fields in, in Tumen and, and Western Siberia. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work on cold fusion. There was a famous um, Soviet doctor, I forget his name now, who invented uh, transplant science. He, he was the first person who, surgeon who invented the transplant of a human heart. Uh, also the human head, which is a little strange. He was studying how to, uh, the possibility of transplanting somebody's head, i.e. the brain, onto another body as a way of overcoming natural limitations of you know, cancer of, a, of, a, of, a, of the lungs or whatever. That person, the, uh, the Soviet government did not permit heart transplant surgery by him to be done, but they opened his scientific papers for global access. And the South African surgeon Barnard, uh, I think was his name, he did the first successful heart transplant uh, in the 19, late 60s. And in his press conference, he said, I'm simply using the methodology of this Soviet surgeon who did this 20 years ago, you know, in studies on dogs and etc. So there's a huge legacy of techno science in the Soviet Union that that is not used. Some of it is used, like space flight, like Elon Musk's company uses, you know, Soviet rocket engines, but the cybernetics was not used because it was completely different focus than the American ARPANET, which was a much narrower function of military communications. The Soviet system was a holistic integration of the entire economy uh, in real time. Chile, actually, for the co comrade from Chile, Chile tried to do that under Allende. They imported this British cybernetic specialist who developed his own kind of idea uh, that was going to do something similar to Glushko. But then, of course, the, the coup happened and then they got rid of it. Um, the thing about the supranational states, well, I mean, I think, I think China's attempts to essentially form some kind of a closer confederation with Russia, perhaps, or Russia and Belarus as a way of fighting this new war against imperialists is probably one attempt to, um, to do something like this. I just hope that Chinese Marxism, Chinese uh, socialism with Chinese characteristic enters Russia, you know, <laughs> and changes its political institutions as well, because I think that would be a good thing. Yes, cyber, cyber sin. Yes. Yes, which is extremely interesting, um, extremely interesting programs, very similar to Glushko's program, as I understand it. And it was destroyed by Pinochet, of course, because, you know, why, why do you need something like that in under capitalist, you know, colonized state? Socialism in Bulgaria, will it return? I think it has no choice. I think, I think Bulgarians who think about politics in an open way, in a smart way, realize that capitalism... There's nothing more that capitalism can offer Bulgaria than it already offers them. Bulgaria will be exactly what it is today, forever under capitalism. It will never get any better. It will always be a peripheral state in the European Union. Why not? Why would Germany or France permit Bulgaria to be, for example, a major producer of computer software and hardware? Why? It makes no sense. So capitalism has nothing to offer Bulgaria um, as a state, as a nation. Um, so inevitably, I think Bulgarians were going to make decisions and, and there's no other way. There's no other way than to move beyond this primitive system called capitalism, which even in the 20th century was already obsolete, you know, relative to the Soviet system, which by the way, I just want to read a statistic just for one second that I found, you know, there's a very, very great systems historian in Russia today, Soviet historian, who writes a lot. And he's, in the, he's a similar figure to, for example, Fernand Braudel in France was. His name is Andrei Fursov. Fursov is um, uh, probably the preeminent Soviet Russian historian in terms of methodology and understanding of capitalism, but also of the Soviet system. And in one of his articles, he writes on Yandex Zen, which is kind of like a Russian Google uh, equivalent. But 
in answer to the question, was the Soviet Union economically sick in the 1980s and thus it was inevitably doomed to become capitalist? He says, he cites the following statistics. He says, actually, official statistic, this is also verified cross-reference with the CIA Western uh, intelligence report to Soviet Union. In 1975, Soviet Union produced 20% of the global industrial production. 20% of the world, far more than West Germany, the United Kingdom, and France taken together in 1975. So, so Germany, Western Europe was not a significant factor in the global economy when you take these three leading countries in the West when compared to the Soviet Union in terms of industrial, economic activity and production, innovation, etc. cetera. Um, the, the gross domestic product, 10% of the world consisted of the Soviet economic activity until 1985, when it started its sharp decline. Uh, the second half of the 1970s, uh, Soviet national income was 66% of the American. So that's not that far away from the, so from the United States, which was the dominant power in the world. Why? Because it suffered no casualties and destruction in World War II. So up until the 1980, the Soviets were within... 66% of the American industrial production. Uh, as a whole, 80, there were, the Soviet production was equivalent to 80% of American industrial production and 85% of American agricultural production. Uh, not to mention the Soviet Union was the global leader in um, space travel, nuclear energy, laser technologies, optics, and cybernetics, i.e. all the technologies that are of importance today. Um, so let, what's, what are the other questions? Uh, so socialism will Bulgaria will return. I, I definitely think so, or whatever else will be invented by people's struggle based on egalitarian uh, principles, socializing the product of human labor uh, within the nation. On the Dnester uh, in Moldavia and uh, and uh, and. Uh, Etc. Again, it's the same problem. Romanian uh, the Romanian uh, bourgeois elites want to assimilate uh, Moldova. The problem is that Moldova experienced 90 years of Soviet period where it became a little bit different than what Romanian national identity is. So Moldova is not Romania the way some parts of it were before World War II or the beginning of the 20th century. Moldova is a different state. So to lay claims to Moldova now, today, the foreign minister of Moldova, I believe, who's a Romanian citizen, an ethnic Romanian, said that it is the goal of Moldova to uh, join Romania and enter the European Union. That's just a form of colonization. It's colonization through internal elites, kind of like Mikhail said, the Polish minority, part of it is mobilized by, the, by NATO to engage in separatist um, uh, movements in Belarus, where other Polish minorities in Belarus probably feel uh, that they have a kind of a common shared Soviet identity and are okay with living in Belarusians because they're Belarusians of Polish uh, descent, and that's okay. Yes, but I would like to say that uh, many of Polish people in Belarus they are not agree with the Poland government. Of course. Yep. For example, yeah. the leader, the chef of the KGB, Belarusian KGB, is Paul. Yeah. And furthermore, the regime change technologies, which are very effective against uh, governments that have very little resources or are deeply unpopular, the, the regime change destabilization you know, maneuvers in 2020 against uh, Kiev, Minsk in Belarus, they would have succeeded if there wasn't a hard and fairly widespread uh, sense that, that Lukashenko has legitimacy among the majority of the Belarusian people. There's no way he could have sustained that kind of pressure. But he did with minimum of violence, absolutely minimum violence, even compared to what's happening in France today. Compare the scenes of how the Macron government is using police violence against the French people today Compare that, which, which is not a regime change. The, the, the French people protesting Macron's today are not working in the interests and they're not funded by some foreign government or governments. Whereas a lot of the protesters, not all, but a lot of the highly organized protesters in Minsk were definitely and clearly and publicly funded by external governments. 
the, the level of violence against them was shorter duration, less days. It was less physical violence used than what the Macron government is doing uh, against the pension reform uh, uh, civil protests today and the Yellow Jackets. I mean, if you combine the two, the French are basically, the French police is beating French citizens almost every day for the last three years. Yes, yes, but in last Saturday, there was the battle uh, with ecologic protest. Uh, it was against the big basin of water um, and there was the 30,000 ecologues uh, and the police used 4,000 grenades against them. 4,000 grenades in two hours. So the every every second there was some grenade, which uh, and the two 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 people are now in hospital uh, and in in coma. I don't know. Uh, yeah, coma. Yeah. Uh, one Can you imagine them... if that happened in 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 Minsk or if that happened in uh, Havana or if that happened in uh, Beijing? what the headlines would have been, you know. But just to say, just to finish on these questions, I think international Marx, the Marxist anti-communist, communist, communist politics globally, not globally, in Europe, in the West, are at a historic low point, I think, because of a couple of things, and I think some of the comments reflected on this. One is communist intellectuals, whether they came from the working class as organic intellectuals or whether they came from some of the other social classes, doesn't matter. But communist intellectuals were had intellectual superiority for most of uh, the last 100 years, 100 to 150 years. So in other words, Marxist or communist, not just Marxist because there are other thinkers too, but communist analysis of politics, of technology, of, of imperialism, of economics, of science, of mathematics, were always took the leading, or most of the time had a leading role. Einstein was a socialist publicly. You know, uh, Thomas Beckett sympathized with the anti-imperialist struggles around the world. You know, there were great mathematicians who were self-defined or self-identified Marxists. To say nothing of writers, to say nothing of organizers at the workplaces, you know? So I think one of the first things that needs to change is just like the comment said, Marxists today need to study higher mathematics. Yes, enough critique of political economy anymore. Enough of that. We all know the critique of political economy. Marx did it. David Harvey does it. Uh, in the Soviet Union, there was the Rosenberg, you know, 800 page, you know, reading capital guidebook. Marxism already, Marxists know the critiques of the capitalist political economy. We know this, but contemporary Marxists, we've fallen behind on, I'm generalizing, but we're falling behind on our understandings of where is modern science and how it's used by capitalist production techniques or capitalists in general. We're behind on cybernetics. What is the Marxist or the communist critique of AI, big data? You know, uh, do we understand that right now we're experiencing change in what it means to be human. The capitalists are redefining what it means to be humans. They're no longer interested in humans. Humans are boring, flawed, irrational people. This is what the transhumanism of, of capitalist neo-fascism is moving towards, right? So what is the communist critique of that? Well, we can say we are living through an epoch where human beings are now redefined as, as homo datum, homo, you know, homo economicus, is now homo datum for the leading capitalists. They're, re they're treating people as if we're indistinguishable from data, which means they can do anything to us. The, the politics of genocide today are much more easily done than 50 years ago because leading capitalists and their industrial enterprises and the new ways of commodity production, they don't even consider humans the basic unit anymore, right? They're much more interested in, tra in human machine cyborg fusions, they're, they're much more interested in trying to move, improve humans with technology and define new races. You know, there's new racisms that are emerging with these technologies. You know, tomorrow there's, there's going to be people with implants then let them live 20 years longer, you know, or experience pain less or whatever, see better. So capitalism is inventing a new theory of race as we speak. But the communist critique, I think, in general, at least in the West, is... is is slagging, is falling behind. We're not, we're not analyzing these things 
We should be talking about where capitalism is going right now with these technologies. And in order to do that, we have to understand mathematics. We have to understand science. We have to understand the new critique of genetics and how it's being used, the pharmaceuticals that made these drugs during COVID. And they're going to use this technology to uh, you know, invent new classes of drugs against cancer, which are going to be differentially priced. So the more money you have, you know, the, the um, hepatitis C vaccine in the United States, which cures people of hepatitis virus, 99% success. I think it costs $150,000 for one injection. So if you have the money, that's the price of your life. It's nothing. You pay it and you don't have hepatitis C anymore. If you don't have insurance, you die of hepatitis C because you have to take ineffective treatment. Or if you have insurance, you still have to pay money out of pocket in order to get it if you need it. So here you have control of life in a totally different, in a new way where you have a cure on one side if you have the money or you die on the other side. So in other words, we need to study the science and the math. Uh, we need to study, we need to study Kaletsky. We need to study uh, Glushko. We need to study the, the cybernetics in order to propose our own alternative, which can then recruit programmers and technology workers to become communists. You know, what is the vision for, for a socialist society, for post-communist, post-capitalist society that contemporary Marxists pr provide? In the West, among my friends, we're, nothing. Nothing that I would be excited about. I mean, my answer is very simple. Bring me back to the Soviet Union, except with Glushko cybernetics and a few other things change and I'm okay. You know, <laughs> but there are other answers too. What is happening in Cuba? I don't know. A lot of things are happening in Cuba. But... In the West, there's censorship. Even, I mean, of course, certain things are published, translated into Spanish, but a lot of Western Marxists, we don't in the we don't take those people too seriously because they're, you know, they're, I mean, they're no, Cuba has made an amazing things in terms of political organization. I want to know what those are. I know that they developed two of their own vaccines against COVID by themselves, which means they have a highly advanced pharmaceutical and, and, and cybernetic uh, economy or, or capability. I want to have, know what's happening in China. China is an extraordinary place. I mean, yes, they're going to say it's an authoritarian place. or All states are authoritarian by definition. All states use coercive, violent force against its political enemies, whether they're capitalist or, or socialist. That's totally expected and it's normal. Any state will use violent force against its political enemies if they're powerful enough. And if they don't, then they don't deserve to exist as a state. I mean, that's Lenin, that's, that's Bismarck, that's anybody you ask who studies politics, that's Machiavelli. So to say that Chinese socialism is not real socialism, this is what the Western kind of fake lifestyle Marxists say, because it's authoritarian. Okay, well, let's ask the question, it's authoritarian against whom and for what purposes? <laughs> and then we can get a more meaningful answer. I don't even mention Stalin because that's like a total taboo in the West. I think the Stalin's, Stalinist, Stalin's intervention, uh, which contains tragic chapters because it was, it was the Soviet party that after the revolution kind of ate itself in a way, but Stalin's interventions are fundamentally important, fundamental importance. And we don't understand it yet because we don't even study it in the West because it's totalitarianism. It's no different than Hitler. That's it. In Russia, they study it. We can read Fursov, and somebody should translate Fursov's big books. They're huge books about the Soviet past. Uh, he talks a lot about Stalin. There's an analysis of the Stalinist epoch. There are other thinkers. There's Keti Chukhurov, whose um, great book was published in English. It's an analysis of the Soviet past in a critique of, of French postmodernism as essentially uh, proto-liberal you know, imperialism. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's much more elegant than that. I'm not doing it justice. But... Uh, what's happening and what happened in Poland or in Hungary or uh, in the big debates about reforming and changing. So none of that stuff is known. And, and it needs to be known because it has to be part of the global sort of communist historical memory so we can draw lessons and pick and choose uh, past experiences and modify them to present conditions, you know, but that means there's a lot of intellectual work that needs to be done and the professors are not going to be the ones who are going to do it only or mostly. We're going to have to do it. Just normal people who, 
who have some kind of skills to do it, either to translate, to share, to post, to what Mikau's doing, to bring different people from different parts of the world who can communicate through English or, you know, to get to know each other's uh, socialist histories or uh, socialist ideas or, or like Chile. Like Chile has a great tragic brief episode with Allende. But what happened? Well, there's a great writer, you know, Roberto Bolaño, who writes about that in all of his literature. And we can read literature through Bolaño's eyes and learn about the Chilean communists, you know, and, and their view on life and their view on take. So there's, we have to save that history, my friends, because that history is under complete and permanent attack and it needs to be erased. That's what's happening. So thank you very much. It's shown that we have a lot of things to talk and you, we need to repeat. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I will read some comments. Uh, to be able to be on top of what goes in Cuba, you need to speak Spanish. Very little what really goes in written in if English. If we can translate that, that would be amazing. Yeah. Or if there's like a website that non-Spanish <laughs> speakers can go, then we can ask friends perhaps to translate it. Or, yeah. Uh, but we, we need to finish because my wife is making impression <laughs> for me. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I, I already <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't ask you, but I hope that you will come back here. Because Absolutely, we... anytime. I look forward to it. It's very important. Okay, it's very important. okay. So so very quickly, I will invite you again. Thank you one more time, and I 